so we'll start with the end of um, tutorial one. So we got through one to four last time. I did finish five and six, but it went off. So we'll do it again. And then, so again, ask any questions as we're going through. And if, it, any, if there's any problems or the sound goes off or it freezes, then just let me know. So we've got these following made up regression from given below. It's looking at the price in thousands of pounds in a random sample of Scottish towns. And it's looking at the effect of the distance in miles from the town's budget store, Lil D's, but I think they mean Lidl. But <laughs> so the first bit is what direction of causality is implied by the estimated regression equation. So this here has given you the fitted OLS line. So this here is what we'd call Y I hat, the best estimated fitted line. And this then is the residual. So again, this is the, these are the OLS estimate. This is the estimate of the coefficient, the intercept, and this is the estimate of the slope coefficient. We've got a sample size of 98, we've got an R squared and the sum of squared residuals. So A, what direction of causality is implied by the estimated regression equation? Well, because we set it up this way, we're assuming then that distance impacts price and not the other way around. So it might not, the distance to the nearest little star directly impacts the price. But again, it doesn't mean that that's the case. There could be a reverse causality, there probably will be, but where implicitly implying or we want to think that distance impacts price directly and then we want to in, in, in estimate the direct effect of distance on price not just how the two are associated with each other okay so OLS broadly speaking just picks up how two variables kind of move with each other on average overall sometimes that will reflect the causal effect sometimes it won't and it won't reflect the causal effect if there's some other factors that are also driving price that are driving distance at the same time. So we'll have some confounding factors. I'm gonna give, we're gonna talk about that in this, this is what this question is getting at. So the direction of causality, because it's set up that way, we're assuming that distance impacts the price. And we'd like that it, there wasn't a reverse effect of price on distance, otherwise we're gonna get a bias, which is literally just the reverse causality bias. So for B, so do you feel the regression equation adequately captures any cause relationship between the two variables? Explain your answer. Well, this is getting at, do we believe the fundamental assumption underpinning OLS holds here? So again, the, OLS would then assume that the true model for price, I, is equal to some intercept, that's B1 price I plus UI. So note the difference, these are the kind of the true unknown fixer parameters and new i is an unobservable term, that's everything else, sorry distance, is everything else that's driving, um, everything else that's driving price over and above the distance to the little star. So this models of course assuming then a, a linear relationship and then it's getting at this is what it's getting at does it pick up the call what we're asking really is is there likely to be a covariance or a correlation between the covariance of all the other factors that are within ui and distance remember this is one of the crucial assumptions in order for ols to be consistent we have to have this exogeneity condition and we've talked about this at length now in the tutorials if we believe this holds that the true causal model then all the other factors that are driving price, namely UI, everything in there. Think of UI as including many potential other variables that drive the price of a house. Do we believe then that they're likely to be uncorrelated with the distance to the Lidl store? And if we don't really believe that's likely to be reflective of the true model, then of course the OLS assumption isn't likely to hold and we're going to get an inconsistent estimate of the true effect of price, of distance on price. So we've seen the wage schooling example. This is just another example of a potential endogenous variable, namely where this may not hold. If it doesn't equal not, then we call this endogeneity, which really is kind of broadly just a reverse causality bias. Some of the facts, what it's saying is that some of the factors driving price also drive distribution. So the above going the right, the above going the distribution affects price, but price, distribution may price may also affect the distribution namely the other factors that drive price could be which are just in you can drive the distance and we don't want that 
So then the question, so that's what it's getting at. So in a question, if you expect to understand, that's what it's getting at. Does this assumption hold, this covariance assumption on you? And so then it's just, then the rest of it then comes down to economic intuition then. Do we think that's likely to be the case? Well, it's likely that the, when the, the little stars, because it's a budget star, because they may, would obviously more likely want to put their stars to people that are likely to shop at their uh, outlet, then they're likely to choose to build their um, outlet nearer to lower or medium income areas relative to the higher income areas. So therefore, it's likely that because when, remember the distance to the, the house, of course, little somewhat has an effect on that because they choose where they're going to locate their stores. And if they choose to locate their stores, locate their stores in lower price areas, well, that's just saying that distribute price may, dis, distance, distance may have an impact on price, but the price is going to have an impact on the distance because if little selected their stores based upon the house price in the area, then that's just saying that UI, the other factors driving price, they, every, they, remember UI is just part of price. It's saying that that is driving the distance and as well as possibly beta one think of as a direct effect of distance on price, but it's likely that UI is going to impact the distance. UI just being all the other factors driving price. And so then maybe you want to give an example. Well, it's likely that UI would include things like, say, the income wages of the average person in the area and so on. And all these other factors are likely to be correlated then with the distance to the store because the distance is going to be, in essence, a measure really of how well, of the, 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 the overall price in the area because people that they're going to, the Aldi is likely to choose stores that are also have kind of lower incomes on average. And incomes, obviously, are going to be related to the price in the area. Okay, so the distance is going to be related to the distance, the distance of the Aldi store is going to be related to income because distance, the, the nearer they are, the, the, sorry, the, the, the distance to the Aldi store from a house and their income is going to be related because they're likely to choose the stores to be nearer to people in lower income areas. And obviously, income is going to drive price. So then you've got to think of, let's, that's just one example. And then so we've got to think, what kind of bias would that cause? Well, then it comes down to what's likely to be the effect of income on price, likely to be pro positive. The higher the income in the area, then the more that people can afford to buy higher priced homes. So there's going to be a positive relationship between price and income. And it's likely then that the distance is going to be then the, f the further away they are from the store, well, Aldi's likely, Lidl, so is likely to possibly set the distance further for higher income people. N or conversely, they're going to put their homes nearer to lower income areas. So lower income areas are probably going to have a lower distance to the, the store. So there's going to be a positive relationship between um, income likely and distribution. So the two things together mean we're going to get a positive bias. It's likely that the covariance between the all the other factors driving price, U, and distance is going to be bigger than not. The further away they are, the higher it is that it, the price in the area is likely to be because possibly little selecting the stores to be nearer to the lower income and lower price area. So there's kind of hundreds of examples in economics of this. This is just another, and it's always the same idea. What are the other what are the factors that all the other factors driving price you or what sorry all the other factors driving the the independent variable in this case price that are likely to be related to the uh, the independent the depend the depend the sorry the dependent variable that are likely to be related to the independent variable distance or the regressors as you sometimes call them. Okay, so the next bit then C is then getting at the same thing. If there is a simultaneity two way causality in this relationship. What impact might this have upon the statistical relationship between the residual and the explanatory variable? So I'm assuming you cover this in the lectures. What it's saying is, it's, it's similar to this. It's the same thing. Is that we, it's, there may be, it may be that price is impacted directly by the distance, possibly. Plus UI. But if it's also the case that, dis, that the price affects the distance, 
then this is the, the simplest example of a simultaneous uh, the, I guess yeah simultaneous equation well, that they're simultaneous they're both determined together distance can impact price but price can impact the distance together and if these two and this is pretty much similar to what we said before that it, it could be that distance impacts price on its own directly but it's likely that the price is going to be the distance is going to be a function of price especially think of this as how, how little might select where to choose their stores they're going to look at the price in the area and then choose their stores to be nearer to the lower price areas so arguably there's going to be a two-way causality here that means the true the true statistical relationship or the true process that generates price and distribution is going to look something like this well then you've got to link that to what does that mean about the relationship between ui all the other factors driving price and distance so remember the research is interested in this isolating this relationship here but you can't negate the fact that in the background there could be this going on that there could be a two-way causality and what this will mean is if delta if gamma one doesn't equal naught we're going to have a it will imply this will imply that the covariance of ui in the, in the in the equation of interest and our regressor doesn't equal not and you can see that just by plugging this into sorry the just by plugging yeah plugging this into here if you plug this equation in you're then going to find the in the error term will then be this epsilon i which is correlated with distance by construction because of course ei and e, ei the the error in the second there was the unobservable in the in the price district dis, distance equation by construction is of course correlated with distance another way is think you so you can write that out formally we don't have to do it here we can do it we can write it on another on another one if you but you can do it yourself plug that into here and rearrange it and see what comes out but intuitively the way to think about it is well, what happens? Well, let's say that UI, let's say that price goes up from UI increases. Well, that implies then, of course, that price increases. That's just saying, then, in essence, the same thing, holding everything else fixed. UI goes up, so price, or another way of saying this, let, let's say that price goes up for other factors not related to distance. Well, that's just saying this here, price goes up. Well, that means then, go back to this equation. Well, this is then going to lead to a change in the in the distance by the amount well related to gamma one. So if UI goes up, price goes up. Well, distance is on average going to change by a factor proportional to gamma one. So if gamma one's positive, which it will be here probably, because Aldi little might choose to put their stores for higher the price area, they'll move further away. Well, that will just mean if UI increases, price goes up. Well, that's going to lead to distance to increase. So you're going to drive a positive covariance between UI and distance. So we'd need here, in order for, if this was the true model, we'd need gamma 1 to be not, which just means that price doesn't directly drive distance. Okay, and in that case, I will be fine. And it's that, that's unlikely to hold. So this is another way of saying the above, really. We gave some, you can think of it that way, but again, you may think of it more broadly. I think even more fundamental than the fact that they may choose to put their stores in lower income areas they may choose to actually just do it by the house price, or they could do it by both and in which case we still get the same thing okay so hopefully that's clear on the intuition so i think it's relatively i mean you've got this bit the formal assumption but really the intuition behind it i think is relatively uh, straightforward that when price goes up it's gonna it's gonna when it's going to mean that they're likely to move their stars away so you're going to find that price and distance move together even if there was no effect of distance on price even if b1 was not and distance didn't impact price directly which probably is likely to be true because there's no reason why the distance to the to the to the little store itself should affect the price you would still find that when pricing when price increases that distribution will distance will increase and you're going to find a positive correlation between these two variables that will then when you include that as a regressor when you do it or less that will make it seem like the distance increasing is making the price increase but it's not it's because the price increased first 
that increase that made them move the stars further away they're finding is positive co-movement so it's just the reverse causality bias okay so the next bit then is to interpret then discuss the estimated slope coefficient for the equation so again for this one this is saying that the OLS, so it's run OLS, it's done the regression of distance on price, not controlling for anything else, and it's found the estimated effect of distance on price to be 65.82. Now, this is a lin -lin linear linear model, and again, it's me measured in thousands. So this just means for a one mile increase in distance, on average, <laughs> there'll be a 65.82 thousand um, pound increase in price so another way of saying that if there's a if there's a one if you move or another way of saying it, if you move one mile away from the little budget star that on average that prices would decrease by 65.8 thousand pounds so 65 thousand um 65 over 65 thousand pounds now now i want everyone to know this is these are not the views of this channel but again, it is, it is. I want little any little representative. This is a made-up regression. Well, I mean that is quite quite even. It's quite extreme, even for even even accounting for the buyer. I mean the average house price is around two hundred thousand pounds. So I think to say moving one mile away from a little store would decrease your price by over a quarter of the actual average value is a stretch. But it's just made up. So this is this just for educational purposes, and then for E. So calculate the total sum of squares for the estimated equation. Well, this is just using the formula. So again, these questions, what they're going to do, you, you're going to you're going to use this formula. The r squared, by definition, is just the sum of explained squares divided by the total sum of squares, and the SST, the total sum of squares, the the sample variance in y, is the sample variance of the residuals. The sum of squared residuals are related to that. It's the sum of squared residuals plus the sum of explained squares. And we're going to show this next. Prove this relationship. But again, even if you don't know how to prove it, you shouldn't you shouldn't know these two formulas. And all that's going to happen in these types of question, so there'll just be one bit missing out so you can get the rest. So in this equation, you've been given r squared, which is 0 0.105 here, and you've been given the um, sum of squared um, residuals here, which is um, 12.88. So then, well, and this is just what we've got here, you can then solve for SST. Well, you can just re rearrange this and plug this in. So you, you can see then you've got everything else now to work it out because you can get, you can solve SSE as 0.105 SST and then plug it in to here so that's just rearranging these two identities here so if we plug in this we, what we've got is the SSE then rearranging the above one is SST minus SSR so if you plug that into here we can rewrite R squared as 1 minus SSR over SST and then you can solve and you get this here okay so once you solve this for city just two equations you've got one unknown to solve for you can write sst as a function of the two things that we can measure and then you plug it in and you find 14.39 so that's relatively straightforward once you've got this identity here and this you're just solving then for the thing that we've not got so these are relatively straightforward if you remember these two um, formulas here Okay, so that's it on so the next bit then is some derivation so this is just algebra so it's a bit kind of dry but it's part of the learning the linear model so the first so again you obviously need to remember the formal definitions of sst and um sse and ssr so the first things that you need to state then of course are formal definitions so we've got the sum of total squares it's just the let me just get the so the sum of total squares is the sum i equals one to n so again think we've got a, again it should give you more detail we've got i think we've got a sample on y and x 
our regressors from r equals 1 to n. So that's kind of the background. And we run a regression of y on x. And in general, there can be an arbitrary number of regressors. regressors. So the sum of total squares is defined as this, where y bar is just the sample mean. So this here, the sum of total squares then, is a measure of the variation of yi around its mean. So the SST, well when you divide this by 1 over n, that's just a sample variance. So this is just a sum, so it's, the y, it's, a, it's a deviation of each y in the sample from its mean squares. So it gives you an, a measure of how much y moves around the mean. So it gives you a measure of how variable y is. The bigger this is, the more that y moves around its mean. So the more scattered y, y will be around its mean. So the more variable it will be. We've got then the SSE. The sum of explained squares. So this intuitively then, this is going to be a measure of how much the model explains the variation in y. So we've got a regression of y on x. So let's just do the simple case where we've just got one an intercept and it all generalizes to the case where we've got multiple um, re regressors but let's just assume that we're doing this regression here and then we run a regression and we get then our fitted value we call yi hat which is just the estimated intercept plus this. This is then our best guess of what y, think of this as a prediction for yi. If we've got Let's say that this was income, y was income, and x was someone's um, years of school in the classic example. Then, if you've got for every years of schooling, you can work out what's kind of the best guess of what their um, income would be. So, I think this is called, again, sometimes called the fitted value from OLS. Okay, so that's some more definition. Again, and this all generalizes to the case when we have multiple uh, regressors. And remember, one of the key things we're going to use here is to remember the first order conditions we solved, and we we talked about this in the first video clip. Remember the two key th conditions that OLS solved to solve for b hat naught and b hat one, where it takes the derivative of the sum of squares residuals with respect to b naught and b one and sets them to naught. What this means is it sets the estimated residuals these on average to be naught, e i hat. So call this e hat here is where well, this would be one over the average yeah so this would be the take the take the sum we'll call it just call it there we've got the sum of the the um residuals is set to naught and we set so we see this many times now and the sum of the estimated residual times by the regressor is set to naught so these are what we actually solve to get the b naught hat one and b hat not one so we solve the that's where we get them from so these two estimated estimators actually solve these two first order conditions and we're going to use these in our expansion to prove this to, to prove this result here so they're just and again so we, we're not going to not going to go through it again we've done it now quite a few times we've got any questions asked but these are two fundamental conditions these are the first order conditions these are the first order condition for minimizing the sum of squared residuals across every possible from every possible b naught and b one. The another definition then is the sum of explained explained squares, sum i equals one to n of the fitted value, kind of the best prediction minus the average of y squared. So this is a measure of how much the fitted value varies around y bar. The average value of y. So y i hat is our prediction of y. If that doesn't move, it's saying that that if this is the smaller the sum of explained squares, it's saying the less of the variation in y is being explained by y i hat. So in the extreme case, if it was just constant, it'd explain none of the variation in um, y. So we kind of want this often to be as big as possible to explain as much as the we want the fitted value y i hat to explain as much as the variation in y so that's a measure of that so the sst is a measure of how much y overall varies around its mean and why the sse is a measure of how much the fitted value our best guess in OLS varies around its mean the sum of squared residuals then is 
just defined then as everything that's left. So we've got sigma what's not explained, which is namely e i hat. We have then y i minus y i hat squared. So again, y i and so this is a measure. Uh, y i hat's a fitted value. We call this is just the residual e i hat. This. So it's everything else that it's, it's everything else that this doesn't explain is then the e i hat. So again, you'll often see this. So again, we're going to use these first order conditions in a bit. So you need to be comfortable with understanding and these. We've got the first order conditions we're going to use and another thing so again this e i hat is just another definition so there's lots of definition we see them a lot and the e i hat is just a residual of everything else so by definition y i can be a just broken up sorry y i can be broken up to the fitted value and everything else so in essence well it, it is e i hat is just defined as this it's just shorthand this is just shorthand for this so this e i hat is just the, the residual in y over and above the predicted value. So this is just an, this is just another definition. Yep. So this we can just write shorthand as this. And this is going to be crucial because we know some properties of this EI hat. Because it's an OLS residual, it satisfies first order condition one and two. So this is everything we need then to answer this question. We've got all the definitions of, of course, we need to define what these things are first. We've got the three definitions and we've got these two first order conditions and that's going to be everything to prove this. The rest from then on in is algebra. So as long as you understand the first order condition and the definitions, there's no reason then why you can't get the rest. It's just then algebra. So then we want to prove the result that this SST can be broken up like this. So the thing to do then, well, is just to work with SST, which is just equal to sigma i plus n. Now we're going to use a trick. We're going to break this up. We want to get. We know that we, we want to prove this. Is, we're going to prove it, right? So we've been told to prove it. So you can't, of course, just take it. You've got to prove that it holds. Well, working backwardly, we want to get these two things to, of course, to appear somewhere. So the thing you can do that. So we've got the y i minus y bar squared. I've just kept the spaces don't change anything to keep the spaces there this is still this is still the SST just written we're going to adapt it well if we subtract out the sorry put this over here right at the end that's the sum of total sum of squared we want to get these two things appearing right so we want to get if y i hat here well when we expand this out we're going to get this bit plus y i hat minus y bar so we can see this being obvious first step it already looks a bit like the two things we're going to expand out to we're going to when we when we square this we're going to get this term coming out squared here which is going to relate to the ssr and when we get this bit coming out squared it's going to relate to the sse and of course we're going to get the cross product term so you can see then that then we expand this would be the obvious way to begin to make it just look like the thing that we're trying to prove it's equal to. Well, when you're working with these algebraic expansions, you can apply the sum afterwards. So when we square this within, we can take the sum after. You can do the square first before you apply the sum. Well, we're going to get the first term squared plus we're going to get two times the at times together. And just to be just to simplify this down again, just call this. This is what we've been calling shorthand as e i hat. So it just makes it easier to write. Again, this is just the residual, right? This here y i minus y i hat by definition is the residual. So we're going to get just to simplify, call that e i hat. So it's going to make it easier to work with. Well, we've already got the first. We've already got the. We can see we're already going to get the SSR coming out. But what after we take the sum plus. 2 e i hat y i hat minus y bar plus the last term squared right so do do this the quadratic and then just take the sum through so the sum of three terms is the sum of them all added together so that should be the sum attached to this so 
plus sigma i equals 1 to n plus sigma i equals 1 to n. If you've got three things added together, well, when you sum them an, an average number of times, it's going to be each individual average added together. So you just, this, the, the sum of all those terms is the, each of the individual sums added together to be a squared. Well, we've already, we're already partway there because we can see that this, the first bit is the, this bit is just the SSR and this bit is the SSE. So if the identity, if the identity holds, well, we've got to prove that this thing is not. So if it is, then the result holds. So. We're going to, we want to see what, so again, you've got to prove it. So now we've got to expand it all out. We're going to use these first order conditions. Well, we've got taking it, writing it back over here. We've got two sigma i equals one to n of e i hat times y i hat minus y bar. So we expand it out. We've got the sum of two terms. Again, you can expand this before the sum, you expand it out. You're going to get e i hat y hat. So again, before you take the sum, just expand it all out. Minus e i hat y bar, and then take the sum through. So you're going to get the sum of them all added together. And again, oh, well, we, we can we, we can drop the two because if, if we can, you keep the two there. It's not going to change. Again, if you're going to show it's not, it doesn't matter if you're going to multiply by two. So again you're going to have the multiplied by 2 outside here. We can keep it there, but it's not going to change anything. Okay. Well, the last to then work, so we'll work it term by term. So let's work with this bit first. Well, the sigma e i hat y bar i equals 1 to n. Well, y bar is a constant. It's just the mean of y in the sample. So whatever it is, it can come outside. It's just... Again, I've dropped out the two, but it's not going to change. Put two there just for me. Right, then we're going to get two y bar. So the y bar comes outside. When we're summing across i, well, y bar's fit. It doesn't change across i. So we're going to get this e i hat here. And we've already got from the first order condition one that this equals not. So again, when you're writing your answer, state the assumption. It comes from this, the first order condition that we set the average of the residuals to have mean naught. So we're going to set the sum of these to naught. So this bit equals naught. So then the last bit to show then is that this term equals naught. So we've done this. So again, this bit is, so we've got the sum e i hat y i hat. Well, again, use the formulas, plug in y, plug in this. And again, remember, y i hat is just the fitted value. So we can plug that in. So we're going to get sigma i equals 1 to n of e i hat. And we've got b hat naught plus b hat 1 x i. By definition, that's just the fitted value. So again, expand it all out and take the sum. You're going to get the sigma i equals 1 to n e i hat. Again, b to hat naught constant, so it comes outside. Plus, again, this is a constant, times plus sigma equals 1 to n, e i hat x i. So all we've done is expanded, plugged in the definition of the fitted value, expanded this out, taken the sum through, taken all the constants outside the sum, and then we can see then, again, it's the OLS first order conditions. This is equal to naught by first order condition 1, and this equals naught by first order condition 2. Again, remember... The, what, what this is doing, it's selecting the coefficients or less estimators to make the residuals have mean naught and be orthogonal or when this thing is going to be set, it's going to have the sample, it's going to make the sample correlation EI hat and XI be naught. And that's what, that's what OLS does. Just that's what defines the OLS estimator. And then remember, that's the reason why we want to assume that in the true model, the covariance of the true unobservable EI and XI is not. Because if that was the case, the best thing we can do is to enforce that in the sample. But again, you don't even need to understand uh, you don't that you don't need to understand that logic. These define what the OLS these both being not define the solution to the OLS problem. That's what that's what defines what these OLS estimators are. So these are crucial that you remember these and understand them. Okay, so hopefully that was clear. 
on the derivation. So there's quite a lot of algebra and remembering definitions, but it's key that you start to understand the intuition of these things so that they come back quicker and you're not just memorizing them. So the next bit then was question two from um, exercise two, tutorial two. So we'll do this in a so it should have given really a bit more detail. So we're going to be working through the, this was, we, we covered some of this in the, um, in the extra lecture and the last, we covered it some in the last, um, shoot the video clip. But we're going to run through it. So what it, we've got the linear, it's got, we've just to, it's really, it's a broader question. So I'll just write it out. What it's, what the question two relates to is a, assuming we've got a linear model with just one regressor and an intercept plus call it EI say so and again these are all assumptions so we're running we're going to run OLS and we're going to assume first of all linearity and we run the OLS estimator and again and another thing is I pointed out in the last video clip the definition of the OLS estimator doesn't rely on linearity holding the definition of the OLS estimator fits a line to a set of points. So it doesn't matter, the true relationship could be anything. The, de the OLS definition is it choose, again, I'll, I'll write it again. It's the arg it's the parameter that minimizes across B0 and B1. Well, this is just really fancy way of saying that the OLS estimators are the solution to the minimization problem of the sum of squared residuals. Yi minus B. We often put like a little let put a naught here to to that the note the distinction that these are the true fixed unknown curve. When we come to make an assumption, we assume that the true y and x are linear like this. But when you come to fit a line to a set of points, it doesn't matter. You just fit the line. You choose a b naught and a b one. You pick an intercept and a slope that will fit as near as possible to a set of points y i x i from i equals one to n. So you're just fitting a line to a set of points so that's the definition of the this is the OLS estimator definition here in this and that's where you get the first order we're not going to run through that now we've done it before and what you will get when you work through this you'll you can write b hat one is the sum of i equals one to n xi so again I'm not going to do this again now watch another video clip or look at the um, the textbooks and the notes xi minus x bar squared and is equal to y bar minus b hat one x bar where y bar and x bar are the sample means so you in this question you really to we got you can just take these so we've got these they cut these are the solutions to this minimization problem here and we're seeing that now a few times so we then want to come, let's make the assumption afterwards. So then, so let's just, just to make clear, this is the definition of the OLS estimate. All we have to have is a sample of Y and X, and we can always do this. We can always fit a line to a set of points. So our best, our best guess then of the estimated line is going to be B hat naught plus B hat one X. That'll be our best guess of the true line. We then want to study the prop. So then the rest of we then want to look at what are the properties of these estimators, what are their means and what are their variances, are they unbiased and how variable are they. So remember these are both random variables, we can see they're a function of x and y, so for every different sample in general we're going to get a different b hat naught and a different b hat 1. Which makes sense because every time you get a different sample of y and x's you're going to get a different scatter plot and the, the line that best fits is going to vary. So that these b hat 1's and b, these are estimates estimated coefficients so they've got a distribution they're going to be random variables and this question asks you to look at the properties of these so the first bit asks you to establish that the OLS b hat 1 is unbiased so what the first one of the questions asks us to prove or, or show under some conditions that e b hat 1 is b1 now we want so again we want to we want to find the conditions when that will hold because it won't always hold B hat one in general, there's no there's no notion on in general why the average of that should estimate be centered around the true value. So we want to make some assumptions. So the course, the key one is that the true relationship is linear because that's been the fundamental. We can see one of the the first assumption we make is that 
the relationship in y and x is linear in parameters like this so we've got this linear in parameters assumption so these assumptions in essence are the assumptions we need for OLS to quote have nice properties for it to be unbiased and so on to be consistent so it's not that it necessarily will hold this is ju these are just the key conditions we have to have so that the OLS estimator will be consistent and unbiased so when what, think of it another way when researchers are trying to work out when does this hold well they have to work through and it will work out some sufficient conditions on the true relationship between y and x when the OLS estimate will be unbiased when on average it will be centered around the true parameter so the key one one of the key ones is linear in parameters the next one and again this is all for i equals 1 to n we've got a sample of i equals 1 to n say a sample of 100 people the another key one is no perfect multicollinearity this is just the assumption that's needed in order for the OLS estimate to exist so we always make this assumption this is relatively trivial because we can remove um, regressors that are perfectly collinear in our example because we've got an intercept and one regressor all we have to have is that xi has variance bigger than not namely it's not constant for example perfect multicollinearity in this model would mean that we include a constant twice because this here b naught is is the effect of the constant so you can think of it being a variable that takes values one everywhere it's still a regressor in the model so we can't have another regressor that's also a constant you can't estimate the effect of a constant twice and that's really what the perfect multicollinearity perfect multicollinearity rules out when you've got more regressors it means that you've not got any perfectly correlated regressors or more generally any linear combination that are redundant otherwise you can't do it let's say that we include the same regressor twice let's say you look at the effect of schooling on wages there's just one effect of schooling on wages you can't look at find two separate effects and in, when there's perfect multicollinearity one the estimate won't even exist so this is relatively trivial that there's no perfect multicollinearity this just means that the estimate OLS estimator exists the next one then is that the average of this unobservable EI everything else that's driving Y given X is not for all possible values of X where to be clear as sometimes is that this X includes all values of X in the sample X1 to Xn okay we've got a sample of values yi xi from i equals 1 to n so this x just stacks them all into one it says that what this assumes is is that the average value of the unobservable all the factors driving x is mean independent of any x for for all possible values of x so any for any possible values of our samples so this is a stronger condition this implies for example that EI is uncorrelated with XI but it's a stronger condition than that kind of roughly broadly speaking it means that the unobservable is uncorrelated with any nonlinear function of X so it's a, it's a stronger condition than the covariance of the EI and X is not and this is the zero conditional mean assumption so we've got linearity no perfect multicollinearity and this zero conditional uh, mean assumption so it's sometimes we can confusing sometimes it can get explained two ways sometimes a, a, the, the, a, a, somebody may say well if we assume if we assume x is fixed in repeated samples you may have heard this what this means is is that the x or the regressors in the sample here were selected by the researcher so for example if you want to look at the effect of say crop yield sorry the effect of fertilizer on crop yield well the researcher could set values of um, fertilizer levels they're going to put on the land say 5 10 20 whatever mil and then they could keep putting those on different plots of land and do the experiments again and again and again and then get a data set and look at the effect of crop yield on um sorry the effect of fertilizer on crop yield well in that in instance the x's were just fixed and selected arbitrarily so there's no notion then that they will be related to any of the other factors driving e or all the other things that were driving the crop yield so if you make the fixed and repeated samples assumption where x is fixed and it automatically implies the zero conditional mean um, assumption all we have to do then is assume that the ei on average is not which we can do just by varying b naught so if you have fixed and repeated samples and assume the mean is not 
Well, that's everything because xi by design is going to be uncorrelated with. Just to say that again, what if fixed and repeated samples means would mean this? That the average value of ei given x doesn't depend on x; it just equals to the average unconditionally of ei. So all we've got to assume is that that is not which is kind of trivial because you can just vary B naught and you can enforce the residuals as EI to have mean naught. So the fixed and repeated samples would automatically imply this. It just And that's what it kind of says. It says if there was kind of mean independent, it just says the average value of the other factors driving Y given X don't depend on X. It's just equal to the unconditional average. So all we've got to then assume is that this is not. So you can either assume that X is fixed and repeated samples and that the mean of VI equals naught. But that's not really useful in econometric examples because the X's, the regressors, often are selected by the agent or the individual or the country. In that case, then it's not fixed and repeated samples. The X is also a random variable. Okay, so if you look at, say, the effects of, say, the institutions of a... Or look at the... Well, keep going back to the wage schooling. If you look at the effects of schooling on wages, well, the person chooses their year of school in their X, and that's going to be implicitly, in general, selected with this EI as well. But in broadly speaking, their person selects their own X, in this case schooling, and therefore it's not selected by the research, it's not fixed. In that case, we just have to assume that this condition holds. So you only really need to remember, you only really need to remember, if this assumption holds, it, imp it implies... It, it, the, the fixed and repeated samples and the me, e, e, I having mean naught will imply this result but that's not very useful as I said because you can't really often assume that in econometric examples so we just assume this condition holds we have to assume that all the other factors that are driving y are mean independent of x so although think of it as a way schooling example we'd have to assume that although the person selected their years of schooling that it doesn't impact on average the level the other fact that their, their um, wages that's what you're assuming here so of course in general it's a very big assumption so and that's that's the key thing you have to verify and that's what we've been talking about earlier does this hold and again for this to hold we have to have that the covariance of ei and x is not because this implies the covariance of ei x is not okay but it's a stronger condition. So we talked this. We talked when we did this in the class. We did in the extra lecture. These are the only three assumptions you need in order to prove unbiasedness. And they're only. And another thing to note is they're only sufficient conditions. In that they don't. For example, this one turns out to be a sufficient condition. Namely, if they all hold, it will be unbiased. But there can be instances when these don't hold, and it could still be unbiased. That's a more technical point but just to be clear these are sufficient conditions if these hold then this unbiasedness condition holds so we're going to do that then we're going to prove this then so what we're going to all we all we need to then have we've got the formula for b hat one and we've got these three assumptions so the first thing we're going to do is go back to b hat one of course in order to prove unbiasedness we want to prove this we're going to go back to this formula and look at its properties the first thing to do is to sub in yi under the first assumption that the linear and parameter condition holds. So again, if you don't assume that, then yi could be anything. So again, that's an assumption. Assuming that yi has got this form, then we can start to look at the properties of b hat 1. So assuming linear and parameters, plugging in, this is the general formula for the OLS estimate, which holds whether or not the true model is linear. As I said, that's just a mechanical definition. And where they're looking at the properties of this, if the model was linear in x, then we can, if the model was linear in parameters, sorry, this would hold. And for simplicity, just define this as SSTX. So define this just to kind of, to not to keep writing this out. And I think it's used in the notes as well. Just call this SSTX, just to make it simpler to work through. We'll then expand it out again. You got this x i minus x bar multiplied by these three terms. So you can expand it out for each one and take the sum through. Well, we're going to get here sigma i equals one to n x i minus x bar. And again, the b naught comes out plus b naught um plus b naught one plus b one 
sigma i equals 1 to n xi minus x bar xi plus sigma i equals 1 to n di. Okay, we've already run through this before. Firstly then, this bit's going to be naught because the sum of x minus its mean is naught by, def by definition. If you sum this through, you'll find naught. So we've done that already. What we're going to be left with then is, so I'm skipping a couple of steps here because we've already done this before. We can find b hat 1 is equal to b1 plus sigma i equals 1 to n xi minus x bar ei. So if some of you are not clear that, the, the other video clip doesn't, we've done it before, I want to leave, just take this as a, you can see it in the other video clip, we can run through that expansion and find this is a key, this here is a key step in showing the properties of b hat 1. So again, all we're, we're working through this and you can use it, you can, we can show, if we expand all this out, we can show it equals to this. And I've done this a number of times now, so I want to, I want to make sure we get through, I don't want to spend too long, we, we've been nearly an hour. So... Again, just if you can't remember, we'll, we'll go back and work through it. Again, it'll be it's in the other video clip. This is, of course, crucial. It says that the b hat 1, the OLS estimator, is equal to the true coefficient plus this random term here. So for every different sample x and y, we're going to get, in general, a different... This is going to vary, right? For every different y and x, these are, going to, these are all random variables. They're going to vary in general. So that this term is going to differ on with different sample. And this is going to drive... The statistical properties of b hat one it's it's going to it's going to determine the, the the distribution of b hat one so we want to establish that the average of b hat one is not but let's begin by showing this that the average value of b hat one given our sample is equal to b1 well if we can prove this then we're done because for all possible values of x because what that says is, if we can, we're going to we're going to prove that the, we're going to prove that the three conditions we stated show this. Well, this implies that e of b hat one given x e of b hat one equals b one unconditionally, because this says that the average of b hat one is given any sample x is b one. So of course, the average of b hat one unconditionally is b one, and you can just do that by the law of law of iterated expectations. Take expectations on both sides. Well, b one's constant, so its average is just equal to itself, and this, by definition, is equal to this. So we're going to now prove what we're going to do is prove that e of b hat one given x is b one for all x. So we can do that by taking conditional expectations on both sides. Well, the average b one's a constant, so its average is always b one conditional on anything. B one is a constant plus the expected value of sigma i equals 1 to n okay. and the reason we're conditioned on x is because again x is a random variable if you took the unconditional expectation here for example if you did this you can do the same thing without conditioning well it's typically, unless x is fixed in fixed and repeated sample, well, we, in general, we can't take this outside because x is a random variable and the average is taken with respect to the whole distribution of y and x here. So if x was a random variable, it can't come outside because it's going to vary. So the, you can't take it, it's not a constant. So that's why you either assume that x is fixed and repeated samples, and I think that's the approach taken in the, the notes on Moodle, in which case that can come outside then because x is already fixed. So you don't need to condition on it. But in general, when x is a random variable, we, we condition and then we look at the property of this. Because if we can show this equals b1, then we're done for all values of x by the law of iterate expectations. So if the average of b hat 1 given x is b1 for every possible value of x, then the average overall has to be then b1. So then we're going to use, we're going to simplify this bit down. And we're going to show it's not and then we're done so that's the next bit well when you condition x that means x is fixed so you're conditioning on that particular value of x so x some, to write it more formally you're going to let x equal some particular value of x so it's going to be fixed it's going to be a stream of numbers that are known to us 
So you can that the, we can treat the x's in like they're fixed, and we can simplify this down. Well, the one over s as t x comes out because we conditioned on the x, so we know what it is. E of some, and then the same thing again. X is fixed. So again, and this is another point to note. X includes all the x's x one to x n. And that's why, and sometimes the notes don't say, I think so, in general, sometimes the books, maybe I was clear on that, that we've got to condition all of the X, and therefore we can take out then, because SSTX is the average, the sample, the variation in X across all the sample. And of course, this sum also is the sum of all the Xs. So we've got to condition on every value of X. Remember, X includes X1 to Xn. It's every value of X in the sample. If you just conditioned on Xi, one point, then we can't take out all of this. We can't take out all values of x, just that one particular point. So we condition all values of x. And then again, x here is constant, so it comes outside. So we're going to get the, the average of the sum is just the sum of all the averages. And then again, the xi comes out within because it's fixed. And then we can see where the assumption comes from now. So we've used linearity to get this. So this first, the first bit when we plugged in y and expanded out, that came from linearity. The no perfect multicollinearity assumption means it exists, namely that this SSTX doesn't equal naught. So again, if those perfect multicollinearity mean we've included the set, we've included a constant twice. X was constant, and if X was constant, well that just means it's sum of squares. The total sum of squares is not because it doesn't move. That would mean it doesn't exist. You can't divide by naught. So we've already implicitly used that to, to find that the estimator exists. And then now the last bit then is to assume, if you assume all these are not for all values of x, well, this just says, and remember that we've been working through with this, this just says the average value of our estimated intercept, the slope coefficient is not for any value of x. So this comes from the third assumption. If all these are not, this then implies that this, sorry, we've been working just with this second term here this here is not because we've got this sum and if each individual one for all i is not then it's not so that's why we assume that all these are not if you have that this term is then not we're just proving that this term is not which means we've got our result that the average value of b hat one given x is b one and then that's it Okay, so this is the more general proof where you don't assume X is fixed in repeated samples. Okay, or if you want to assume X is fixed in repeated samples, the proof is even easier because you don't need to condition, you can just treat X as fixed anyway. Okay, so if that's, I think it's better to learn it this way because this is the more general um, proof which is more useful in econometrics because X in general is not fixed in repeated samples. So as a finer point, so like I said earlier that these are sufficient conditions where you can see that if we assume that all of these are not, well, it implies that the sum is. But it could it could be that all of this sum just balances out to not, even if these individual terms aren't not. So it's not in practice it's likely not going to happen. But technically speaking, you can have that this condition holds even if some of these are not not, so long as all this sum balances to not. So all of these could be not not, but this sum is going to be these x i minus x bar. Some going to be positive and some be negative. So you could have them bad. This could be balanced out here. Okay, so that's if you don't, that's just a, a side point. But technically, these are just sufficient conditions, especially this one here. That's sufficient to prove the result, but it's not necessary because it could technically hold without that. But in practice, that's probably not going to happen, and it's also not really verifiable as well. So it's not really very useful in practice. Okay. So the next, so we're nearly there. We're now just going to work through. <laughs> I know it's a little bit. There's a lot to get. But the, the last two bits, we're going to work out the variance of b hat one again. In the question two, exercise two, it just asks you to work out the unconditional variance, variance of b hat one, which you can do, but you have to assume that x is fixed. So it should be a bit specific and say. But in general, if you just, with general, we're going to work with, with this. Because we don't generally assume that x is fixed we're going to work out okay we don't generally assume in general x is random so we want to look at what's the variance of the slope coefficient for our particular sample because in s in the end that's that's what we're interested in anyway what's the variance of it in our sample that we have and that's also something we can work with then we're going to work through this and then next and i think this is a bit harder 
we're going to work the variance of b hat naught given x and then we're going to finish because we've done an hour before i begin this so we're going to, in in this when we work this through we're going to use this expansion from before so remember we've got b hat one we can write the estimate equals true value plus this random term so you're going to use this over and over again xi written in this way ei Okay, we've already, so again, we've assumed up to now to get the unbiasedness, we've assumed, again, these are assumptions, we've assumed linear in parameters. No perfect multiple linearity, which is trivial here, it just means that x isn't a constant. And we've assumed this zero conditional mean. All of this gave us the unbiasedness result. Again, this is this upside down a means for all values of i. Again, this is for all points in the sample, all values of x. So this gave us the unbiasedness. We're now going to drive the properties of the variance of b hat one, and this is going to depend on the variances and the covariances of e. And we're going to assume that the covariance of e i and x i is not. And again, because we're assuming the mean is not, this is the covariance. This is the covariance of e i and i and j. And for we're going to assume that's not and because the mean is not this is just them assuming that the variance of x ei squared given x is constant for all i and these are the gauss markov extra so these are the four gauss markov conditions these next two we're going to use to simplify down the expansions for the variance formula so these may not these may not hold this is here this is that there's no heteroscedicity so the homoscedicity assumption and we also have to assume that there's no correlation between the errors sorry for for i and doesn't equal j for different points in the sample remember because we assume that this is not well let's take this one for example you will have seen it variance of ei given x is constant but when the mean of ei given x is not the variance of ei equals this remember the formula for the variance of ei given x is the general formula is the expectation of the deviation of ei from its conditional mean remember it's a conditional variance it's a very conditional on x so we get the deviation of the ei from its mean in the in the sample x squared condition upon x we'll assume that's not so it just simplifies down to e of ei squared given x so when you assume the zero conditional mean you can write the variance either way you can keep it in its general formula this is just shorthand for the formal definition anyway and the formal definition simplifies to this if this conditional mean holds because this will be not and the same for the covariance so the covariance will be equal to this when the mean is not okay so again that's what they are it's going to be easier to work with them in this form when we work through the the uh, proof so these were the unbiasedness assumptions and the next two are not needed from biases but they will simplify down the expansion for the variance of the what they're going to do is they're going to be make it easier to derive the formula for the variance and another thing you've seen them for is under the gauss mark as a part of the gauss markov condition which we talked about in the last um well we're going to some of well some of you've got some of you got it yet to come but all of these are the gauss markov conditions and under these all of these conditions together we can show that the ols estimator has a lowest variance relative to any linear um, other linear unbiased estimator or that it's blue okay so these may not necessarily hold in practice but none of them may but even if these do we don't need these to hold it just means that ols has got more efficiency properties and it also makes the formulas for the variances easier to derive and estimate so these have got some benefit but they can be worked around if they don't hold these are the really key crucial conditions that underpin the the uh, the, cru the the unbiasedness of the um, ols estimator okay so we're going to then work we're going again we've used this this comes from the definition of the ols estimator and we've expanded it out under the linearity assumption that's all we've used to get to here well, then we need the definition of the variance of b hat 1 given x, which again, as always, is the average value of 
the random variable around its mean, in this case it's a conditional mean because it's a conditional variance, squared, conditional on the x. So this, all this is, looks really grand, but it's just really, the, all it's saying is, it's just shorthand for, this just means take the average with respect to the distribution of y for a given value of x. So it's just working out the variance of b hat 1 for a given sample. So all the properties of the variance are the same for the unconditional and the conditional. But so they, they've, they've got the same intuition, it's just the unconditional is a variance for overall, for all values of x on average, and this is the variance of b hat 1 just in our particular sample x, for a given value of x. This is the general formula. Well, we can start simplifying this. We've already used the assumptions. We're going to start to use the assumptions now. So under the first three assumptions, we got unbiasedness, which meant that this was not. So the first step, and again, it's key that you write all the steps down. This simplifies down to this, given x, because e, b, and again, you should label all the assumptions and state which all refer to them. So this, fo this follows by 1, 2, and 3. The next bit is to use linearity, which gave us this. We could simplify down. Remember, we got this by plugging in y, assuming it was linear. So this here equals to the average value of sigma i equals 1 to n. Wait, wait, not the squared, e i. This came from 1. Because to get this expansion required plugging in y, which is assumed to be linear in parameters. So that came by the linearity assumption. Remember, b hat, b, the, taking this, we can take b1 to the other side. So b hat 1 minus b1 is just equal to this. So that's just rearranging it, plugging it in to here, and then squaring it. So I missed the square. Right, all we do is plug it in, and then squared. Well, the first thing we can do is we condition on x, so x is fixed. So we can take out the sum of square residuals. So we're going to get this SSTx comes out squared. So again, we condition on x, so x is fixed. The expectation of I'm assuming it's still working all right. <laughs> I'm just not. I, I'm not just talking to myself. All right. The um, I, I've just got. I've got into this and I've realised it might. It might not even be running. So I hope people are listening. I'm not just. Or that it's at least recording, and I'm not just talking all this squiggle to myself. Um. Right. So then that. Oh, we're done. This SSTX is constant. It comes out. So it's, it's a, when we condition on x, it's fixed, so therefore it comes out as just a constant. We've then got to work through this thing. So this is kind of the trickiest bit. Well, I mean, it's just algebra, but this is kind of the bit. We've got this, this here is just the sum of n terms all squared. And it's going to become the double sum. So we're going to, we're going to come back to this. So we're going to keep working down from that. But... But what we'll see, part of this is going to be working with sigma i equals 1 to n xi. Remember, within that, we had to expand this. We're going to, we want to work out the conditional expectation of this squared. So we're going to work with this algebraically now. This here is just the sum of n terms. Although these are products of two things, but they're just two terms. They're just, this is just, call it zi. It's just the sum of n terms squared. So you can write it generally as sigma i equals 1 to n z i squared. That's all this is. 
just with writing it generally now, just to make it easier to work through, call that the ZI. And remember the I, it, it doesn't actually really exist, it's just a placeholder, it just it just makes writing the sum easier. So remember, this is just shorthand for say, should probably work it. this is just shorthand for saying. Z1 plus Z2 plus dot 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 Zn. That's what it says. So the same thing. It's just, you just this, this is just shorthand to say take the sum across i of this and add them all together. So it's kind of like a computer language. You plug in i equals one and add it to i, and then, and then evaluate it that i equals two. You're going to get a Z2 and add them all together because you're going to add Z1 to Z2 up to Zn. So it's just shorthand for saying that. Well, this is just the sum times together, so you can rewrite this as z1 plus to zn times, well that's just a square. So then you can expand it all out, you're going to get z1 times by all of this, which is again just the sum of, this is just, again just the sum i equals 1 to n zi. So it's zi times all of the zi together, plus z2 times all of the z's added together plus dot 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 zn times all of the z's added together so you're going to get this double sum right all that this is just some fixed term just some number the sum of these n z's is just equal to whatever 10 25 and then you've got the sum across the z's again so you can rewrite this as the sum from i equals 1 to n of zi and each one is times by the sum Call it sorry from j call it j equal one to n from then times sum i equal one to n. Again, the j is a placeholder, right? It doesn't actually exist. If you what this says is remember is take this, all of this, evaluate it at j equals one, you're gonna get this. Add it to j equals two, you're gonna get this, and add it all together up to n. So you're gonna get this double sum. So you're going to use this a lot. So I hope you understood that and work through it again. You get the sum. You're going to sum all of it. All it's doing is summing all the cross products together. And you can write that succinctly like this. It's the sum of the product, all possible products added together. Which kind of makes sense. All the z's times all the z's. You're going to get all the squares and all the cross products. If you expand this out, you're going to get back to the above. So you try it for n equals 2 and 3 and you'll see that the identity holds. So we're going to use this a lot, this double sum. Um, in deriving variances it's crucial. So we can use this in our example evaluated our particular, well our zi was xi. So we're just going to get xi minus x bar ei times the zj which is the xj minus x bar ej. Then we can plug it in. So we can then go back to our above and use this and write this, this the square of the sum of these n terms can be rewritten as the double sum i equals 1 to n xi minus x bar times xj minus x bar ei ej and then and that's it so these two things are equal okay so we've got the double sum all the products times together added all together and again remember we want the conditional expectation of this so we can take the conditional expectation through. So we want e of this given x. And of course, we've got divided by this SSTX squared. Again, remember, it's, that's equal to the variance. So we've got all of that, and the SSTX squared comes out here. So this is then the key step. So then we've got to simplify this down. Well, we've got the, ex the conditional expectation of the sum of all this. And the expectation of the sum is the sum of all the expectations. Again, so that comes within. The, sum of the average of the sum is the sum of all the averages. That's another way of, so we're going to have this. given x 
And again, we're conditioning on x. Well, all the x are fixed. So this xi, xj thing can come outside the expectation because it's all functions of x. And we're assuming we're we'll conditioned on x. Therefore, x is fixed. Let's get rid of all that. Well, then that's the next key step. Then, then so again, simplify it down again. So that should be squared 1 over sst x squared. And again, not all the x will be conditioned so they come out because we're, they're fixed. When we can, so you can either assume that they're fixed in a repeated sample or we're going to use this here. The, we're working with the conditional expectation. We don't need to because we're, we're conditioned they're all fixed. And now you see, hopefully, where we've now got the variance of b hat 1 in our sample is equal to all this. And the key bit that's going to drive the properties is this. So when i doesn't equal j in the different parts of the sample, that's the covariance of the i and ej. And when i equals j, it's equal to the variance because you're going to get ei squared. So you can you remember to so go back to here. We can see oh, this is why these two assumptions are going to be crucial in looking at the properties of the variance. It's going to simplify that sum down a lot. It's going to make a lot of the terms equal not, and all the rest are going to be the constant. Okay, so that's why you can see that the variance of this b hat one x, which is this all that we can see this is the variance of b hat 1 given x so we can see the properties crucially depend on this and that's why we make the assumption that the errors are uncorrelated given x and the variance of the errors is constant because it simplifies this variance formula down so again when r equals j we've got it comes out we've got the e of ei squared is a variance and that's going to be sigma squared So you're going to get two possibilities. When you take this double sum, you've got the case when r equals j, which you're going to pull out the variance. So you're going to get 1 over sst x squared double. Well, first, you're going to get the case when r equals j. So you're going to get sum, call it i equals 1 to n of x, i. You've got all the, all the squares and all the cross products. Expectation of. Plus, and then breaking that sum up, you're going to get all. You're going to get when i equals j, all the cross product term, all the all the all the square terms in the expansion, and then all the cross product terms. So the sum i doesn't equal j. All the rest are going to be not. So you can just write it short and like this. You're breaking that sum up into the in the, into the case when you've got the the squares and then the cross products times e of e i e j given x, right? Well, when i doesn't equal j, these are not by assumption. We've assumed that for i doesn't equal j, that the co what the covariances of the kind of the ei, the, the unobservables in different points of the sample are not. So that's say the covariance of the the wage residual so one person in the sample are not related to those from a person in a different area. So that would kind of be the intuitive assumption. There's no covariance in these other factors that are driving, say, people's wages or incomes that they're uncorrelated. If we assume that. This is not, all these are not, and this, well if all these are constant across x, if all these are sigma squared, then it simplifies down because the sum can come outside. And then that's it. So the, the next step is by the assuming that all the errors are uncorrelated, condition on x, this term equals not. And then by the homoscasticity assumption, all these, all these variances of epsilon i given x are all constant. So it's sigma squared, so they come outside. So you're gonna get sigma squared times SSTX. Well, this is just again, this is just squared, and this is just the SST of X, the definition of it. Well, we could just call it shorthand this. So again, we've got SSTX on the top divided by this bit. Before we took that constant out divided by itself squared so we're just going to get one over the sst of x so that's going to be that would be one over sst of x so we get sigma squared divided by the sum of squared total sum of squares of x so you've seen this then in the notes in the lecture in the book so there's quite a lot to that right and it is hopefully you see now why where all the assumptions come in and what's going on so if we assume, um, well, let's just take the case where all the errors are correlated, so we get down to this. Well, if all the errors are correlated, 
if all the errors are in collated, well, in general, the, the variance of our intercept estimator is still quite complex because these could vary across x on the sample. If they're all constant, well, the formula for this simplifies down to that. And these are what the st state estimates by default, it estimates this. Now, this is what the variance of OLS is if all the Gauss-Markov conditions hold. Crucially, then, that there's constant variance on the residuals and no correlation between them. If the errors did have non-constant variance, well, of course, this would then be the formula. And that's what the, these are, this is what the robust standard errors estimate. Again, assuming that the errors are correlated, so that the other term dropped off. Assuming that, well, the, if, there is, if there's non-constant variance, namely that this variance changes with x well then you can't take it outside here and you've got to work with this more general formula and the robust standard error in essence just replace this unknown quantum with an estimate and that's the robust standard error so we, the point is that if all if the if all the conditions hold if there's constant variance and no correlation between the errors and all the gauss markov held then this would be the formula for the variance of the beta hat one which of course much simpler but if, if, the, if, the, if there was non-constant variance, then this is the formula. And in general, they're not going to be equal to each other. So the robust standard error is just estimate the general formula that we should estimate before we make further assumptions. But anyway, that's how you show the derivation of the variance of the OLS estimator under all of the Gauss-Markov conditions. Oh. <laughs> We're nearly there. Oh, the last one. So the last one. Actually, it's not too bad. We've got the variance of. Remember, we've looked at the, We've just we've just derived the variance of b hat one. Given x. And we've shown it's sigma squared divided by SSTX under all those assumptions, at the beginning, the Gauss Markov assumptions. So we now want to look at deriving the variance of b hat naught, the OLS estimator of the intercept. Well, that is, remember, we've not, we, we derived it in the last clip. It's y bar minus b hat 1 x bar. And you get that by setting the residuals on average equal to naught and plugging in the estimate from b hat 1. This is the estimate of the intercept. Once you've got the estimate from b hat 1 for the, for the intercept, then you can get it from this. This is, this is what you find as a solution to the first order condition for OLS. So we've got, we want to work out what's the variance of b hat naught given x under all those assumptions. Right? Well, let's simplify it down a bit. Well, remember, yi is equal to, assuming linearity again, alpha naught plus b naught xi plus ui so the average we'll take the averages through this just means the average of y bar equals well alpha naught because it's just a constant so the average of alpha naught is alpha naught plus sorry it's actually b1 there plus b1 that's constant times x bar so the average of xi is x bar plus the average of the residuals now remember sorry the average of the unobservable so this is a key point the UIs are random variables that are unknown to us and they've, uh, they've assumed, we're assuming they've got mean naught. So when you look at the average of a set of these unobservables, well, they're coming from a distribution that's got mean naught, but it doesn't mean that they're exactly not. The av and I talked about this in the extra lecture. The sigma UI hats, they're the estimated residuals and OLS is selected to force these to be equal to naught. So the average of the estimated residuals are not but the average of the actual unknown unobservables that are random variables well they they've got mean naught in the whole population but for any particular sample there's no reason why they've got actual mean naught in the sample just like if say stock prices let's say they do have stock returns if they did actually have mean naught at the population level well when you observe an actual sample from say a year or whatever the mean's going to be near to naught in the sample, but not exactly naught. That comes from a random variable. And therein lies the distinction. I hope that's clear. The distinction between the actual unobservable UI and the UI hat, which come from this fitted 
value here, which forces this. Remember, OLS selects the these parameters to make these UI hats have, we call it, sorry, beta not hat. It selects these coefficients, B hat not and B hat one, to make these estimated residuals UI hat have mean not. But in the actual true population model level model, all we're assuming is, is that the population averages of these actual UIs that we're trying to estimate have got mean not. So U bar, which here again is just the average of UI, the unobservables, just comes from a distribution with mean not. We can't, we've not forced that to be not because that comes from the true model, not from our estimated model. So that's a key thing to, to, to know. Then we need to get what, again, so we've got y bar. So we now want to simplify down our um, formula for the estimated intercept. Well, we're going to have y bar minus this. So we're going to get, so you can see then, we're going to get b naught, let's actually call it b naught, b naught hat is equal to b naught plus b one x bar plus the average of the unobservables minus b hat one x bar. So all we're doing is taking the formula for the intercept and plugging in y bar from the true model which we assumed is linear so we've used linearity there well this is just then b naught plus u bar and then we can take the x bar outside so we're going to get minus b hat 1 minus b1 x bar taking out the x bar because x bar is just oh no why do these things force you to do whatever happens what x bar and then Okay, so all we've done, we've plugged in y bar, assuming that the model's linear, taken the averages through, and then plugged it into here. And then taking out the x bar is just a fixed number, take it outside. So we can rewrite the intercept estimate as this. Okay, so then we're going to work with, well, the formal definition of this variance of b hat not given x is equal to, again, remember the. Is it was the average of b hat naught, the de deviation around its conditional mean in this sample x squared given x. Now we've not shown that b hat some b hat naught some bias, but it will be under these assumptions. So we leave that as an exercise to prove that this under the assumptions has that this equals b naught. We're not going to, we're not, we're not, if we can do a similar type of proof that we had before, we're going to leave that for now and just work through with this. Assuming that that does hold, which it does, you can show it, we can do it in another, in another clip, is then e of b hat naught. So that comes from the first three assumptions that, do, that gave us unbiasedness before for b hat one. Okay. So this comes from this again. You need to state that in your derivations. Well, we can get b hat minus b naught from the formula. Again, we can take b naught to the left, and we're given this. So it's the average of this squared. Plug that in. That comes from the linearity assumption. All squared. So the notes with a couple of typos in the notes on this. So there's a few bits. Just follow this this um, approach. The next bit, it got the overall step. There's a few bits, but this is the full way, and now you need to link it to the assumptions as well. So we get the. So we've got the we reviewed unbiasedness, which has come from the first three assumptions: zero conditional mean, linear model, no perfect multiple linearity. And then we've just used a formula for the OLS estimate of the intercept here, which we derived in the last clip. And then assume linearity then to work out and simplify down. Similar to how we did for b hat 1, we used linearity there, we plugged in the linear y and worked out and expanded for b hat 1. You can do the same for b hat naught. We've then got to expand this out. Well, let's write it again. So we're getting there now, there's not much left if anyone wants to actually want. E of, so we've got E of u bar, the average of the u's minus b hat 1 
Nine times x bar squared. Well, we've just got two, this is just a quadratic in two terms. So when we expand it out, so before we take the expectation through, we're going to get u bar squared minus 2 times u bar b hat 1 minus b1 plus, and then the last term squared, b hat 1 minus b1 squared x bar squared. So that's just squaring those two terms added together. We're going to get a quadratic. So it's each each one squared added together plus two times added together. So we're going to get this. And then take the expectation through. Conditional. Again, we've got the average conditional expectation of three terms. So it's the individual, all of the, 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 the average of them all added together. So we're going to get E of U bar squared. So it's, it's linear, so it satisfies the linearity. It's additive, sorry, minus. Again, the 2 comes out because it's constant. And again, we're conditioned on x. So x bar squared is just a scalar and it's just constant because we're conditioned on x. So we can take out the x bar squared. right well we've already derived this this here is the conditional variance of b hat 1 assuming that it's unbiased which it is because we're making all the unbiasedness conditions so this we've already got as sigma squared over the total sum of squares of x from before okay remember that's the formula for the variance of b hat 1 given x when b1 is unbiased the estimator. So we've derived that, we have shown that earlier under the conditions. All that's left is to work through the other terms. Well we can work out this here, so working this term through first. Well u bar squared is just shorthand which is the average of ui sigma, remember this is not the estimated residuals, it's the average of the unobservables from the true population model. So they're not, they've not got a sample mean naught, they just come from a distribution with population mean naught. So these are random variables that are not equal to, um, don't have mean naught given x. And again, we've got this double sum, right? So we've got the sum of ui squared, so the, well the 1 over n comes out because it's constant. And we've got then the expectation of the sigma i equals 1 to n, sigma j equals 1 to n, u i u j. So the notes, the, the miss a lot of the steps out for this, I think. So this, again, we saw this before. We've got the, we've got the sum of n terms added together. So when we square up the app, we're going to get the double sum. So we use this result earlier, given x. Oh, I guess, sorry, we've been calling it ei. Sorry, it's, we've been calling it, okay, we switched. Okay, we've been calling it EI. It doesn't really change. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a, we should keep it consistent. So we've been calling it EI. It doesn't really matter what you label the uh, unobservable to be, but let's just keep it consistent with the earlier. Sorry, I should have. We've been again. It's just EI. There's is it unobservable from the true model. Well, again, we can simplify this down. This is going to be one over n squared. With the expectation of the sum is the sum of all the expectations. So we're going to get this. So we use this step before, similar, this kind of idea. So you're going to use this a lot. So give an x. And again, we've got we've got the case when i equals j when we're going to get out all the variances. Sigma i equals 1 to n expectation of e i squared given x. Plus the sum when i doesn't equal j, it's going to be not. So we're going to get sigma i doesn't equal j, and we're going to get all of the covariances of e, i, and e, j. Well, these are all not under our assumption, the Gauss-Markov, and all these are constant, so they're sigma squared. So we're going to get the sum of 
i equals 1 to n sigma squared over n squared. Well, sigma is constant, so we're going to add a constant together n times. So we'll get n sigma squared over n squared, which is sigma squared over n. Right, so we've then shown, we've, we've got this part, because we've already worked out the variance of b hat 1, and we've worked out this part, it's just equal to sigma squared over n. So from these two terms, we've then got, we then keep all that as just working through this bit here. Taking this down, we've got equals sigma squared over n from this proof, minus 2 times e of u bar b hat 1 minus b1 given x, plus and we've got this x bar squared sigma squared over the total sum squared plugging in this into here now the answer is this term plus this term that's it because what we can show is that this is not and that's the last step so I think the notes just said assume it but you can't, you've got to actually show it we can show that it's not well I mean you need to that you need the you, you don't just assume it's not you can actually derive it all out and you can show under the gauss markov conditions that this will actually be not under the OLS uh, Gauss Markov conditions. So the answer is this plus this and we can show that this is not. So we're going to show that now and then the rest is then just manipulating those two terms. We're going to show this term is not and that's the last key step. If that's not the variance is just this add this. Okay and we can then so we're, going, we're now going to look at the I think this is the hardest bit it's the we've got to show that this given x is not. If that's not, then it's just the first term added to the third term, and that's the answer. So why is this not? Well, again, plug everything in. So I mean, I, I at first just take a bit. When you look at it, it looks a bit odd. But if you plug it all in, it's worked through. So again, we're going to show it's not under the under the Gauss Markov conditions. Well, plug in um, u bar and the b hat. We know that b hat one minus b1 so again it's got to become second h because you're going to see this a lot this xi minus x bar ei and we've got the u bar so again it's using the definition we've got these you've got 1 over n and then multiply them out Sorry, e, I keep calling it u i, we've got u bar, so we've been calling it, I've done it again, we've got e bar, we've been calling this e, so we call it, keep calling it epsilon, so we'll call it e bar, and we've got e bar here. Okay, well then, multiplying all that out together, well what we're going to get, put it all in, this is going to be the expectation of, well, we've got the 1 over n could come outside. Well, you keep it in for now if you want. 1 over n, sigma i equals 1 to n of ei times by, uh, we call this over the, again, the i is easy, you can call these anything. What we call these is irrelevant. Call that for j, you've got to give them different subscripts. You call it s, t, whatever, it's irrelevant. It's just, this is just shorthand for the sum of this from 1 to n. So whether you call it j or k or whatever else is relevant, it can't be the same as i here because they're two, they're, do, they're both doing two different sums. So we've got the sum of all, this just says the sum of all the uh, errors times and then this sum of all this term here. divided by SST of it and again condition on X. Well, the X again with condition is fixed, so it comes outside, we can take the one over N outside as well. So we're gonna get one divided by N SST X times average of, and again, we've got this double sum inside now, sigma I equals one to N, J equals one to N. It's every possible one of these times together. 
all the EIs, most probably every one of these XI minus X bar all time together. Are you going to get all the cross products possible? So we're going to get XI. Okay, so we just multiply them together. We've got this double sum. And again, the expectation of the sum is a sum of all the expectations, so it goes with inside the sums. And remember, we're conditioning on X, and what we can just skip the one step. Because X is fixed, when we take the conditional expectation, we then need to come outside, because X is a fixed when we condition. Wait, wait, we, uh, no, no, yeah. well, we don't need, sorry, I've added something in there. That's not there, of course. Sorry, what was I doing? When we timed it together, it's just this times the other one. So it's just this. Sorry, I thought, I thought I was going. We got this for E, um, I times this other one for the E, J. So we've got each possible one of the epsilons times by each one of these possible X, I minus X bar times E. So we're going to get this. So sorry, I shouldn't. Got this, so it's actually not as messy. We've got this, then x i minus x bar, and then times. So we've got this coming again, all of these variances and the covariances. And when i doesn't equal j, all the covariances are assumed to be not. So by that assumption, this is going to simplify down. So by the uncorrelatedness assumption, it's going to simplify down to 1 over n sst x sigma i equals 1 to n e of sorry the x again so we've got when we take this double sum we've got the sums when i equals j and then i doesn't equal j so only the sums when i equals j come out and there's going to be n of them so we're going to be left with so we're only there so when i equals j here we're going to get ei squared given x again assured me the uncorrelatedness so that all of those are not all the when i doesn't equal j they're all not so the sum simplifies down and we're assuming all these are constant sigma squared so the sigma squared comes out and that's it because we already see now that this by definition is not this sum xi minus x bar okay so that's it the last bit then is so We've got, we've what we've done here. We've we've got it we're in this in this expansion for the variance of b hat naught. We have three terms: the first and the third, which are the answer, and this middle term, which we're going to show is not. We've been working out this e bar. Well, we've got the formula for the average of the unobservable. And we've got the formula for this for the OLS estimate. All we've done is use the formulas and plugged them in, and expanded it all out. We've then used the assumptions. Then we got down to this. This simplifies down. This is a general answer, but then it simplifies down. If all the correlations are not, when i doesn't equal j, different points in the sample, the sum simplifies down to this. And if all these variances are constant, it comes outside the sum. And that's it. And this last term equals not. So we've got that the average value of the average of the unobservable times the OLS estimated minus its mean given x is equal to sigma squared over m and you should already realize now this last this bit is not because we can see that because sigma and again it should be using this a lot now sigma x i minus x bar well it's the sum of x from around its mean so by definition if we expand it out you're going to get sigma i equals 1 to n x i minus the sum of x bar n times x bar is just a constant number you're going to get n times x bar and remember x bar just by definition is the average of n x i so this just equals not by definition of this just plugging in so this is not this is n times x bar oh <laughs> we're done i know there's a lot there we probably might need to be watched again but it's all there and i think it's right so if, you have, if anyone's got any points but i think if 
Was it alright? Did anybody actually watch? <laughs> well, I guess it's there for later, right? Even if I was just... Um, hopefully it was useful. Um, so, we can do another one. If people want to do some... Especially for some revision um, practice questions um, after... Before the final uh, exam. So, I shall leave it there. And I'll see the rest of you later in the week. So, see you later. Was it okay? Is anyone watching? <laughs> Let me go.